Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. This week, we're reading a selection from Excursions, a collection of essays by Henry David Thoreau, first published in 1863. Let's relax and join him on a winter walk. The wind has gently murmured through the blinds, or puffed with feathery softness against the windows, and occasionally sighed like a summer zephyr lifting the leaves along the live-long night. The meadow mouse has slept in his snug gallery in the sod. The owl has sat in a hollow tree in the depth of the swamp. The rabbit, the squirrel, and the fox have all been housed. The watchdog has lain quiet on the hearth, and the cattle have stood silent in their stalls. The earth itself has slept as if it were its first, not its last sleep, save when some street sign or woodhouse door has faintly creaked upon its hinge, cheering forlorn nature at her midnight work, the only sound awake twixt Venus and Mars, advertising us of a remote inward warmth, a divine cheer and fellowship, where gods are met together, but where it is very bleak for men to stand. But while the earth has slumbered, all the air has been alive with feathery flakes descending, as if some northern Ceres reigned, showering her silvery grain over all the fields. We sleep, and at length wake to the still reality of a winter morning. The snow lies warm as cotton or down upon the window sill. The broadened sash and frosted panes admit a dim and private light which enhances the snug cheer within. The stillness of the morning is impressive. The floor creaks under our feet as we move toward the window to look abroad through some clear space over the fields. We see the roofs stand under their snow burden. From the eaves and fences hang stalactites of snow, and in the yard stand stalagmites, covering some concealed core. The trees and shrubs rear white arms to the sky on every side, and where were walls and fences, we see fantastic forms stretching in frolic gambols across the dusky landscape, as if nature had strewn her fresh designs over the fields by night as models for man's art. Silently, we unlatch the door, letting the drift fall in, and step abroad to face the cutting air. Already the stars have lost some of their sparkle, and a dull, leaden mist skirts the horizon. A lurid, brazen light in the east proclaims the approach of day, while the western landscape is dim and spectral still, and clothed in a somber Tartarian light like the shadowy realms. They are infernal sounds only that you hear. The crowing of cocks, the barking of dogs, the chopping of wood, 
the lowing of kine, all seem to come from Pluto's barnyard and beyond the sticks, not for any melancholy they suggest, but their twilight bustle is too solemn and mysterious for Earth. The recent tracks of the fox or otter in the yard remind us that each hour of the night is crowded with events and the primeval nature is still working and making tracks in the snow. Opening the gate, we tread briskly along the lone country road, crunching the dry and crisp snow under our feet, or aroused by the sharp, clear creak of the wood sled, just starting for the distant market from the early farmer's door where it has lain the summer long, dreaming amid the chips and stubble, while far through the drifts and powdered windows we see the farmer's early candle like a paled star, emitting a lonely beam, as if some severe virtue was at its matins there. And one by one the smokes begin to ascend from the chimneys, amidst the trees and snows. The sluggish smoke curls up from some deep dell, the stiffened air exploring in the dawn, and making slow acquaintance with the day, delaying now upon its heavenward course, in wreathed loiterings dallying with itself with as uncertain purpose and slow deed as its half-awakened master by the hearth, whose mind still slumbering and sluggish thoughts have not yet swept into the onward current of the new day. And now it streams afar, the while the chopper goes with step direct and mind intent to swing the early axe. First in the dusky dawn he sends abroad his early scout, his emissary, Smoke, the earliest, latest pilgrim from the roof, to feel the frosty air inform the day. And while he crouches still beside the hearth, nor musters courage to unbar the door. It has gone down the glen with the light wind, and o'er the plain unfurled its venturous wreath, draped the treetops, loitered upon the hill, and warmed the pinions of the early bird. And now perchance, high in the crispy air, has caught sight of the day o'er the earth's edge, and greets its master's eye at his low door, as some refulgent cloud in the upper sky. We hear the sound of wood chopping at the farmer's doors, far over the frozen earth, the baying of the house dog, and the distant clarion of the cock. Though the thin and frosty air conveys only the finer particles of sound to our ears, with short and sweet vibrations, as the waves subside, soonest on the purest and lightest liquids in which gross substances sink to the bottom, they come clear and bell-like, and from a greater distance in the horizon as if there were fewer impediments than in summer to make them faint and ragged. The ground is sonorous, like seasoned wood, and even the ordinary rural sounds are melodious, and the jingling of the ice on the trees is sweet and liquid. There is the least possible moisture in the atmosphere, all being dried up or congealed, 
and it is of such extreme tenuity and elasticity that it becomes a source of delight. The withdrawn and tense sky seems groined like the aisles of a cathedral, and the polished air sparkles as if there were crystals of ice floating in it. As they who have resided in Greenland tell us, that when it freezes, the sea smokes like burning turf land, and a fog or mist arises, called frost smoke, which, cutting smoke, frequently raises blisters on the face and hands, and is very pernicious to the health. But this pure, stinging cold is an elixir to the lungs, and not so much a frozen mist as a crystallized midsummer haze, refined and purified by cold. The sun at length rises through the distant woods, as if with the faint clashing, swinging sound of cymbals, melting the air with his beams and with such rapid steps the morning travels, that already his rays are gilding the distant western mountains. Meanwhile, we step hastily along through the powdery snow, warmed by an inward heat, enjoying an Indian summer still in the increased glow of thought and feeling Probably, if our lives were more conformed to nature, we should not need to defend ourselves against her heats and colds, but find her our constant nurse and friend, as do plants and quadrupeds. If our bodies were fed with pure and simple elements, and not with a stimulating and heating diet, they would afford no more pasture for cold than a leafless twig, but thrive like the trees, which find even winter genial to their expansion. The wonderful purity of nature at this season is a most pleasing fact. Every decayed stump and moss-grown stone and rail and the dead leaves of autumn are concealed by a clean napkin of snow. In the bare fields and tinkling woods, see what virtue survives. In the coldest and bleakest places, the warmest charities still maintain a foothold. A cold and searching wind drives away all contagion, and nothing can withstand it but what has a virtue in it. And accordingly, whatever we meet with in cold and bleak places, as the tops of mountains, we respect for a sort of sturdy innocence, a Puritan toughness. All things beside seem to be called in for shelter and what stays out must be part of the original frame of the universe, and of such valor as God himself. It is invigorating to breathe the cleansed air. Its greater fineness and purity are visible to the eye, and we would fain stay out long and late, that the gales may sigh through us too, as through the leafless trees, and fit us for the winter, as if we hoped so to borrow some pure and steadfast virtue which will stead us in all seasons. There is a slumbering, subterranean fire in nature which never goes out, and which no cold can chill. It finally melts the great snow, and in January or July is only buried under a thicker or thinner covering. In the coldest day it flows somewhere, and the snow melts around every tree. 
This field of winter rye, which sprouted late in the fall and now speedily dissolves the snow, is where the fire is very thinly covered. We feel warmed by it. In the winter, warmth stands for all virtue, and we resort in thought to a trickling rill, with its bare stones shining in the sun, and to warm springs in the woods, with as much eagerness as rabbits and robins. The steam which rises from swamps and pools is as dear and domestic as that of our own kettle. What fire could ever equal the sunshine of a winter's day, when the meadow mice come out by the wall sides, and the chickadee lisps in the defiles of the wood? The warmth comes directly from the sun, and is not radiated from the earth as in summer. And when we feel his beams on our backs as we are treading some snowy dell, we are grateful as for a special kindness, and bless the sun which has followed us into that by-place. This subterranean fire has its altar in each man's breast, for in the coldest day and on the bleakest hill, the traveler cherishes a warmer fire within the folds of his cloak than is kindled on any hearth. A healthy man, indeed, is the complement of the seasons, and in winter summer is in his heart. There is the south. Thither have all birds and insects migrated, and around the warm springs in his breast are gathered the robin and the lark. At length, having reached the edge of the woods and shut out the gadding town, we enter within their covert as we go under the roof of a cottage and cross its threshold, all sealed and banked up with snow. They are glad and warm still, and as genial and cheery in winter as in summer. As we stand in the midst of the pines, in the nickering and checkered light, which straggles but little way into their maze, we wonder if the towns have ever heard their simple story. It seems to us that no traveler has ever explored them, and notwithstanding the wonders which science is elsewhere revealing every day, who would not like to hear their annals? Our humble villages in the plain are their contribution. We borrow from the forest the boards which shelter and the sticks which warm us. How important is their evergreen to the winter, that portion of the summer which does not fade, the permanent year the unwithered grass. Thus simply and with little expense of altitude is the surface of the earth diversified. What would human life be without forests, those natural cities? From the tops of mountains they appear like smooth-shaven lawns, yet whither shall we walk? but in this taller grass. In this glade covered with bushes of a year's growth, see how the silvery dust lies on every seared leaf and twig, deposited in such infinite and luxurious forms as by their very variety atone for the absence of color. Observe the tiny tracks of mice around every stem, and the triangular tracks of the rabbit. A pure, elastic heaven hangs over all, as if the impurities of the summer sky, refined and shrunk by the chaste winter's cold, 
had been winnowed from the heavens upon the earth. Nature confounds her summer distinctions at this season. The heavens seem to be nearer the earth. The elements are less reserved and distinct. Water turns to ice, rain to snow. The day is but a Scandinavian night. The winter is an arctic summer. How much more living is the life that is in nature, the furred life which still survives the stinging nights, and from amidst fields and woods covered with frost and snow sees the sunrise. The foodless wilds pour forth their brown inhabitants. The gray squirrel and rabbit are brisk and playful in the remote glens, even on the morning of the cold Friday. Here is our Lapland and Labrador, and are there not the ice cutter and wood chopper, the fox, muskrat, and mink? Still, in the midst of the Arctic day, we may trace the summer to its retreats and sympathize with some contemporary life. Stretched over the brooks, in the midst of the frost-bound meadows, we may observe the submarine cottages of the caddisworms, the larvae of the placipines. Their small cylindrical cases built around themselves, composed of flags, sticks, grass and withered leaves, shells and pebbles, in form and color like the wrecks which strew the bottom, now drifting along over the pebbly bottom, now whirling in tiny eddies and dashing down steep falls, or sweeping rapidly along with the current, or else swaying to and fro, at the end of some grass blade or root. Anon, they will leave their sunken habitations, and crawling up the stems of plants, or to the surface like gnats, as perfect insects henceforth, flutter over the surface of the water, or sacrifice their short lives in the flame of our candles at evening. Down yonder little glen the shrubs are drooping under their burden, and the red alderberries contrast with the white ground. Here are the marks of a myriad feet which have already been abroad. The sun rises as proudly over such a glen as over the valley of the Seine or the Tiber and it seems the residence of a pure and self-subsistent valor, such as they never witnessed, which never knew defeat nor fear. Here reign the simplicity and purity of a primitive age, and a health and hope far remote from towns and cities. Standing quite alone, far in the forest, while the wind is shaking down snow from the trees and leaving the only human tracks behind us, we find our reflections of a richer variety than the life of cities. The chickadee and nuthatch are more inspiring society than statesmen and philosophers, and we shall return to these last as to more vulgar companions. In this lonely glen, with its brook draining the slopes, its creased ice and crystals of all hues, where the spruces and hemlocks stand up on either side, and the rush and sere wild oats in the rivulet itself, our lives are more serene and worthy to contemplate. As the day advances, the heat of the sun is reflected by the hillsides, and we hear a faint but sweet music 
where flows the rill released from its fetters, and the icicles are melting on the trees, and the nuthatch and partridge are heard and seen. The south wind melts the snow at noon, and the bare ground appears with its withered grass and leaves, and we are invigorated by the perfume which exhales from it, as by the scent of strong meats. Let us go into this deserted woodman's hut, and see how he has passed the long winter nights and the short and stormy days, for here man has lived under this south hillside, and it seems a civilized and public spot. We have such associations as when the traveler stands by the ruins of Palmyra or Hecatompolis. Singing birds and flowers perchance have begun to appear here, for flowers as well as weeds follow in the footsteps of man. These hemlocks whispered over his head, these hickory logs were his fuel, and these pitch pine roots kindled his fire. Yonder fuming rill in the hollow, whose thin and airy vapor still ascends as busily as ever, though he is far off now, was his well. These hemlock boughs and the straw upon this raised platform were his bed, and this broken dish held his drink. But he has not been here this season, for the Phoebes built their nest upon this shelf last summer. I find some embers left, as if he had but just gone out, where he baked his pot of beans, and while at evening he smoked his pipe, whose stemless bowl lies in the ashes, chatted with his only companion, if perchance he had any, about the depth of the snow on the morrow, already falling fast and thick without, or disputed whether the last sound was the screech of an owl or the creak of a bough. And through this broad chimney throat, in the late winter evening, ere he stretched himself upon the straw, he looked up to learn the progress of the storm, and seeing the bright stars of Cassiopeia's chair shining brightly down upon him, fell contentedly asleep. See how many traces from which we may learn the chopper's history. From this stump we may guess the sharpness of his axe, and from the slope of the stroke on which side he stood, and whether he cut down the tree without going round it or changing hands, and from the flexure of the splinters we may know which way it fell. This one chip contains inscribed on it the whole history of the woodchopper and of the world. On this scrap of paper, which held his sugar or salt perchance, or was the wadding of his gun, sitting on a log in the forest, with what interest we read the tattle of cities, and those larger huts, empty and to let, like this, in high streets and broadways. The eaves are dripping on the south side of this simple roof, while the titmouse lisps in the pine, and the genial warmth of the sun around the door is somewhat kind and human. After two seasons, this rude dwelling does not deform the scene. Already the birds resort to it to build their nests, and you may track to its door the feet of many quadrupeds. Thus, for a long time, nature overlooks the encroachment and profanity of man.
the wood still cheerfully and unsuspiciously echoes the strokes of the axe that fells it, and while they are few and seldom, they enhance its wildness, and all the elements strive to naturalize the sound. Now our path begins to ascend gradually to the top of this high hill, from whose precipitous south side we can look over the broad country of forest and field and river to the distant snowy mountains. See yonder thin column of smoke curling up through the woods from some invisible farmhouse, the standard raised over some rural homestead, there must be a warmer and more genial spot there below, as where we detect the vapor from a spring forming a cloud above the trees. What fine relations are established between the traveler who discovers this airy column from some eminence in the forest and him who sits below? Up goes the smoke, as silently and naturally as the vapor exhales from the leaves, and as busy disposing itself in wreaths as the housewife on the hearth below. It is a hieroglyphic of man's life, and suggests more intimate and important things than the boiling of a pot. Where its fine column rises above the forest like an ensign, some human life has planted itself, and such is the beginning of Rome, the establishment of the arts, and the foundation of empires, whether on the prairies of America or the steppes of Asia. And now we descend again to the brink of this woodland lake, which lies in a hollow of the hills, as if it were their expressed juice, and that of the leaves which are annually steeped in it. Without outlet or inlet to the eye, it has still its history in the lapse of its waves, in the rounded pebbles on its shore, and in the pines which grow down to its brink. It has not been idle, though sedentary, but like Abu Musa, teaches that sitting still at home is the heavenly way, the going out is the way of the world. Yet in its evaporation it travels as far as any. In summer it is the earth's liquid eye, a mirror in the breast of nature. The sins of the wood are washed out in it. See how the woods form an amphitheater about it, and it is an arena for all the genialness of nature. All trees direct the traveler to its brink. All paths seek it out. Birds fly to it. Quadrupeds flee to it and the very ground inclines toward it. It is nature's saloon where she has sat down to her toilet. Consider her silent economy and tidiness, how the sun comes with its evaporation to sweep the dust from its surface each morning, and a fresh surface is constantly welling up. And annually, after whatever impurities have accumulated herein, its liquid transparency appears again in the spring. In summer, a hushed music seems to sweep across its surface. But now, a plain sheet of snow conceals it from our eyes, except where the wind has swept the ice bare and the sear leaves are gliding from side to side, tacking and veering on their tiny voyages. Here is one just keeled up against a pebble on shore. 
a dry beech leaf, rocking still as if it would start again. A skillful engineer, methinks, might project its course since it fell from the parent stem. Here are all the elements for such a calculation. Its present position, the direction of the wind, the level of the pond, and how much more is given. In its scarred edges and veins is its log rolled up. We fancy ourselves in the interior of a larger house. The surface of the pond is our deal table or sanded floor, and the woods rise abruptly from its edge, like the walls of a cottage. The lines set to catch pickerel through the ice look like a larger culinary preparation, and the men stand about on the white ground like pieces of forest furniture. The actions of these men, at the distance of half a mile over the ice and snow, impress us as when we read the exploits of Alexander in history. They seem not unworthy of the scenery, and as momentous as the conquest of kingdoms. Again, we have wandered through the arches of the wood, until from its skirts we hear the distant booming of ice from yonder bay of the river, as if it were moved by some other and subtler tide than ocean snow. To me it has a strange sound of home, thrilling as the voice of one's distant and noble kindred, a mild summer sun shines over forest and lake, and though there is but one green leaf for many rods, yet nature enjoys a serene health. Every sound is fraught with the same mysterious assurance of health, as well now the creaking of the boughs in January, as the soft suff of the wind in July. When winter fringes every bough with his fantastic wreath and puts the seal of silence now upon the leaves beneath, when every stream in its penthouse goes gurgling on its way, and in his gallery the mouse nibbleth the meadow hay, methinks the summer still is nigh and lurketh underneath, as the same meadow mouse doth lie, snug in that last year's heath. And if perchance the chickadee lisp a faint note anon, the snow is summer's canopy, which she herself put on. Fair blossoms deck the cheerful trees, and dazzling fruits depend. The north wind sighs a summer breeze, the nipping frosts to fend, bringing glad tidings unto me, the while I stand all ear of a serene eternity, which need not winter fear. Out on the silent pond straightaway, the restless ice doth crack, and pond sprites merry gambols play amid the deafening crack. Eager I hasten to the vale as if I heard brave news, how nature held high festival which it were hard to lose. I gamble with my neighbor ice and sympathizing quake as each new crack darts in a trice across the gladsome lake, one with the cricket in the ground and faggot on the hearth, resounds the rare domestic sound along this forest path. Before night we will take a journey on skates along the course of this meandering river, as full of novelty to one who sits by the cottage fire all the winter's day, 
as if it were over the polar ice with Captain Perry or Franklin following the winding of the stream now flowing amid hills, now spreading out into fair meadows and forming a myriad coves and bays where the pine and hemlock overarch. The river flows in the rear of the towns, and we see all things from a new and wilder side. The fields and gardens come down to it with a frankness and freedom from pretension which they do not wear on the highway. It is the outside and edge of the earth. Our eyes are not offended by violent contrasts. And here at length, all fences stop, and we no longer cross any road. We may go far up within the country now, by the most retired and level road, never climbing a hill, but by broad levels ascending to the upland meadows. It is a beautiful illustration of the law of obedience, the flow of a river. The path for a sick man, a highway down which an acorn cup may float secure with its freight. Its slight occasional falls, whose precipices would not diversify the landscape, are celebrated by mist and spray and attract the traveler from far and near. From the remote interior, its current conducts him by broad and easy steps, or by one gentle inclined plane to the sea. Thus, by an early and constant yielding to the inequalities of the ground, it secures itself the easiest passage. No domain of nature is quite closed to man at all times, and now we draw near to the empire of the fishes. Our feet glide swiftly over unfathomed depths, where in summer our line tempted the trout and perch, and where the stately pickerel lurked in the long corridors formed by the bulrushes. The deep, impenetrable marsh, where the heron waded and bittern squatted, is made pervious to our swift shoes, as if a thousand railroads had been made into it. With one impulse we are carried to the cabin of the muskrat, that earliest settler, and see him dart away under the transparent ice like a furred fish to his hole in the bank. And we glide rapidly over meadows where lately the mower wet his scythe through beds of frozen cranberries mixed with meadow grass. We skate near to where the blackbird the peewee and the kingbird hung their nests over the water and the hornets builded from the maple in the swamp. How many gay warblers following the sun have radiated from this nest of silver birch and thistledown. On the swamp's outer edge was hung the supermarine village where no foot penetrated. In this hollow tree, the wood duck reared her brood and slid away each day to forage in yonder fen. In winter, nature is a cabinet of curiosities, full of dried specimens in their natural order and position. The meadows and forests are a hortus siccus, the leaves and grasses stand perfectly pressed by the air without screw or gum, and the birds' nests are not hung on an artificial twig, but where they built them. We go about dry shod to inspect the summer's work in the rank swamp, and see what a growth have got the alders, the willows, and the maples testifying to how many warm suns 
and fertilizing dews and showers. See what strides their boughs took in the luxuriant summer, and anon these dormant buds will carry them onward and upward, another span into the heavens. Occasionally we wade through fields of snow, under whose depths the river is lost for many rods to appear again to the right or left, where we least expected, still holding on its way underneath with a faint, stentorious, rumbling sound, as if, like the bear and marmot, it too had hibernated, and we had followed its faint summer trail to where it earthed itself in snow and ice. At first, we should have thought that rivers would be empty and dry in midwinter, or else frozen solid till the spring thawed them. But their volume is not diminished, for only a superficial cold bridges their surface. The thousand springs which feed the lakes and streams are flowing still, the issues of a few surface springs only are closed, and they go to swell the deep reservoirs. Nature's wells are below the frost. The summer brooks are not filled with snow water, nor does the mower quench his thirst with that alone. The streams are swollen when the snow melts in the spring because nature's work has been delayed, the water being turned into ice and snow, whose particles are less smooth and round, and do not find their level so soon. For over the ice, between the hemlock woods and snow-clad hills, stands the pickerel fisher, his lines set in some retired cove like a Finlander, with his arms thrust into the pouches of his dreadnought, with dull, snowy, fishy thoughts, himself a finless fish, separated a few inches from his race, dumb, erect, and made to be enveloped in clouds and snows, like the pines on shore. In these wild scenes, men stand about in the scenery, or move deliberately and heavily, having sacrificed the sprightliness and vivacity of towns to the dumb sobriety of nature. He does not make the scenery less wild, more than the jays and muskrats, but stands there as a part of it, as the natives are represented in the voyages of early navigators, at Nootka Sound, and on the northwest coast, with their furs about them, before they were tempted to loquacity by a scrap of iron. He belongs to the natural family of man, and is planted deeper in nature, and has more root than the inhabitants of towns. Go to him, ask what luck and you will learn that he too is a worshipper of the unseen. Hear with what sincere deference and waving gestures in his tone he speaks of the lake Pickerel, which he has never seen, his primitive and ideal race of Pickerel. He is connected with the shore still as by a fish line, and yet remembers the season when he took fish through the ice on the pond, while the peas were up in his garden at home. But now, while we have loitered, the clouds have gathered again, and a few straggling snowflakes are beginning to descend. Faster and faster they fall, shutting out the distant objects from sight. The snow falls on every wood and field, and no crevice is forgotten, by the river and the pond, on the hill and in the valley. Quadrupeds are confined to their coverts, and the birds sit upon their perches this peaceful hour. 
there is not so much sound as in fair weather, but silently and gradually every slope and the grey walls and fences and the polished ice and the sere leaves, which were not buried before, are concealed, and the tracks of men and beasts are lost. With so little effort does nature reassert her rule and blot out the traces of men. Hear how Homer has described the same. The snowflakes fall thick and fast on a winter's day. The winds are lulled and the snow falls incessant, covering the tops of the mountains and the hills and the plains where the lotus tree grows, and the cultivated fields, and they are falling by the inlets and shores of the foaming sea, but are silently dissolved by the waves. The snow levels all things and enfolds them deeper in the bosom of nature as in the slow summer Vegetation creeps up to the entablature of the temple and the turrets of the castle and helps her to prevail over art. The surly night wind rustles through the wood and warns us to retrace our steps while the sun goes down behind the thickening storm and birds seek their roosts and cattle their stalls. Drooping, the laborer ox stands covered o'er with snow and now demands the fruit of all his toil. Though winter is represented in the almanac as an old man facing the wind and sleet and drawing his cloak about him, we rather think of him as a merry woodchopper and a warm-blooded youth as blithe this summer. The unexplored grandeur of the storm keeps up the spirits of the traveler. It does not trifle with us, but has a sweet earnestness. In winter we lead a more inward life. Our hearts are warm and cheery, like cottages under drifts, whose windows and doors are half concealed, but from whose chimneys the smoke cheerfully ascends. The imprisoning drifts increase the sense of comfort which the house affords, and in the coldest days we are content to sit over the hearth and see the sky through the chimney top, enjoying the quiet and serene life that may be had in a warm corner by the chimney side, or feeling our pulse by listening to the low of cattle in the street or the sound of the flail in distant barns all the long afternoon. No doubt a skillful physician could determine our health by observing how these simple and natural sounds affected us. We enjoy now a boreal leisure around warm stoves and fireplaces and watch the shadow of moats in the sunbeams. Sometimes our fate grows too homely and familiarly serious ever to be cruel. Consider how for three months the human destiny is wrapped in furs. The good Hebrew revelation takes no cognizance of all this cheerful snow. Is there no religion for the temperate and frigid zones? We know of no scripture which records the pure benignity of the gods on a New England winter night. Their praises have never been sung, only their wrath deprecated. The best scripture, after all, records but a meager faith. Its saints live reserved and austere. Let a brave, devout man Spend the year in the woods of Maine or Labrador and see if the Hebrew scriptures speak adequately to his condition and experience. 
from the setting in of winter to the breaking up of the ice. Now commences the long winter evening around the farmer's hearth, when the thoughts of the indwellers travel far abroad, and men are, by nature and necessity, charitable and liberal to all creatures. Now is the happy resistance to cold when the farmer reaps his reward and thinks of his preparedness for winter, and through the glittering panes sees with equanimity the mansion of the northern bear, for now the storm is over. The full ethereal round, infinite world disclosing to the view shines out intensely keen, and all one cope of starry glitter glows from pole to pole. And with that, we've reached the end of A Winter's Walk from Excursions by Henry David Thoreau. That was really lovely, and I'm so glad I could share it with you. If you'd like to comment on this book, or suggest one you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or send me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. I always love hearing from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.